medications. So we're first going to talk about anxiety and depression. Then we're going to touch a little bit on antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, and then finish up with a, a brief overview of treatment of ADHD. Um, so jumping into an anxiety and depression, our main treatments are psychoactive drugs. Um, they, they affect uh, neuroconduction or neurotransmission cascade in some way, working on one of the neurotransmitters. So uh, mo usually our targets are dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, and then with our benzos, we're going to target GABA. Uh, and that's the target, that's the believed to be the target also for like gabapentin and um, partially the target for, you know, Lyrica, uh, which is similar to gabapentin. The classes uh, that we're going to use to treat anxiety and depression are SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or we have a, some other medications that are non-selective norepinephrine serotonin reuptake inhibitors and a few other atypical um, mechanisms of action. So we're not going to go very much into benzos here because I believe you've y'all have covered benzos pretty um, thoroughly on your anticonvulsant lecture. Um, so we're yeah, so we're we're basically benzos are used to treat you know as needed symptoms of of anxiety. You you don't really want to get, use benzos scheduled for anxiety. You could. Um, if, if necessary, but we'd like to use some, uh, an antidepressant for treatment of anxiety. And now when you get into, you know, for those of you taking the psychopharmacology class in the summer, it'll get in, we'll, we will get into, you know, which medications are approved to treat social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder and general, general anxiety disorder. Um, but no, for the most part, they all have some kind of evidence treating anxiety. Uh, so the, the, it, just about any of them can be used you know, if, if the patient tolerates them well. So we also have nor, norepinephrine dopamine agonists, serotonin agonist reuptake inhibitors, norepinephrine and serotonin agonist, MAOIs or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and then obviously benzos or GABAergics. Um, that work on GABA receptors, which, you know, the GABA, um, as our neurotransmitters go, GABA is the inhibitory transmitter that we think about. So think about it in this way. GABA slows you down, calms you down, and glutamate is its opposite, which is excitatory. GABA, or glutamate hypes you up. So glutamate and GABA are, are opposites in that way. So here is where all these blue sides are slides that I've Put in here. I've pulled some of the le the slides from my lectures from the psychopharmacology class. Um, not all of them. We'll go more in depth comparing all of the SSRIs and SNRIs and and um, kind of when to use which ones more. You know, in comparison. But um, we're going to go over the blue ones, and then I'm going to skip over the ones that your that, that came with your book, the ones with the white background. There, it's good information, but I just like the order that these go in. Um, I just don't quite understand the, the order of the classes of medication that your that your book go, talks about because you know there's it definitely mentions trazodone and MAOIs and medications we don't use for depression really anymore before SNRIs and SSS and, and SSRIs which are our two of our you know mainstays along with bupropion and mirtazapine so we're gonna go through the blue slides and we're gonna skip all the way down pretty much to um, antipsychotics, but please do read those slides. They're important. It's just a different way of getting the information. So, duration of treatment. It depends on the risk of recurrence. Not necessarily a lifelong treatment, but if a patient is um, under 40 years old, has had two or more previous episodes, or a person at any age with three or more episodes, they do recommend lifelong therapy. Treatment options are medication, psychotherapy, combination therapy, I high, it, 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 the most effective treatment you're going to get is if a patient will get psychotherapy, you know, counseling along with medication. Psychotherapy beats medication every time they're tested against each other for depression or anxiety. 
Psychotherapy is always more effective. They're most effective when done together. But why? So then why don't people do psychotherapy as much? Well, it's harder. You have to go every week, every t a couple times a week to see your counselor, your psychiatrist, your psychologist. You have to practice the skills. You have to um, continue going and or and for medication. Most of the medications are generic. I can get a month's worth, possibly 90 days worth, and I can just take the pill, and um, and it helps. So it's just easier to get the medication. Um, you know, so th it, there there are there are lots of things that play into it, but absolutely, combination of psychotherapy and medication is the most effective by far. So wh where do you make your initial medication choice? Because all of our classes of antidepressants are equally effective. In comparable doses for depression and and for some most of them for anxiety so what do you look at you look at familial history of antidepressant if they have a first degree relative who responded well they're likely going to respond well to that one also concurrent medical history presenting symptoms whether it's agitation and kind of a nervous anxiety or a, um, or depression or is it fatigue malaise and an apathetic depression Potential drug interactions, adverse events profile, because they do vary from class to class, patient preference, and then cost. And one thing to point out is failure to respond to one medication in a certain class does not predict a failed response to another in that class. There are five SSRIs we use for depression. Just because you don't respond to Prozac does not mean you're not going to respond to the others. And that's frustrating to hear because... We don't have a good way of predicting which one, besides first degree relatives, which one's going to be effective. So when you're treating anxiety and depression, like we talked about the in, in the intensive, the recommendation is to pick one. If that doesn't work after six to eight weeks, then pick another. And then pick another. Maybe you want to give them both together. So um, combination therapy or something like that. So, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, it doesn't, one SSRI, Failing does not may mean the rest are not going to work at all. So, our first category, our most commonly used an um, antidepressants for anxiety and depression are SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin back into the neuron. So, what that means is your neuron has serotonin in it. It's just sitting, sitting and waiting to act it gets the stimulus to release serotonin to talk to the next neuron. So it releases serotonin into the synapse. Well, your body doesn't want to make serotonin every time it has to transmit information. So your body, your, the neuron will actually up, reuptake that serotonin for use later. It's a lot more efficient than having to make serotonin every time we, we need to use it. So what this does is it blocks that reuptake and it leaves more serotonin in the synapse to act on the receptors of the next neuron. So you net an increase in, of serotonin. Uh, the reason they're used so often is they're, they're, very, they're very safe in overdose, they're very tolerable, and they're just as effective as all the other antidepressants. And they're inexpensive. Most of them are, you know, on $4 lists or $10 lists at, pharma, at outpatient pharmacies. And if not, then they're they're definitely covered first tier, cheap, generic on an insurance plan. So, there are side effects with SSRIs, um, just like any drug. Class wide side effects they are going to be a little different depending on e each one, but you're, we're talking about how, a variation in the percentage. Number one most commonly complained about is sexual dysfunction. It happens with, when you have an elevation of serotonin. It, it is possible. About 17, 15 to 20 percent of people will complain about that. So there are other drugs we can switch them to if that happens. Also drowsiness usually happens within the first two weeks and then goes away. Um, if you go down the list, the anxiety uh, in 11 percent, some people are surprised by that because this is used as an anxiety medication. Um, but what we really see is that is an increase in anxiety and, agita edu and agitation in the first two weeks of therapy, and then we see relief of those symptoms. 
So um, if a patient is really, if they're getting this for anxiety or they're, they're kind of having an anxious, agitated depression, you may, you may need to give something, um, you know, for anxiety, a benzo, Vistaril, Atarax, um, something, you know, if nothing else, coping skills, uh, because, because it, it, it can, it can cause that. You also see, um, the nausea that's at the bottom of this list at 6%, you do end up seeing more, a higher percentage of that in the first two weeks of patients, but that's like, you know, the nausea you get with starting any new medication. It, it'll upset your stomach, and after a week or two, you know, take it with food, and then after a week or two, you won't even notice that you're taking it. Most people don't notice they're taking it after the first two weeks, and, and any side effect they have is not worth stopping the medication except the sexual dysfunction. And we can't get around that without essentially reversing the mechanism of action of the, of the medication. We can't really treat it um, as well as stopping the medication would. So, in case I didn't go over it earlier, you have a list of your SSRIs on here. Most people are familiar with these names, um, even if they didn't know they were SSRIs. You know, sertraline, paroxetine, fluoxetine, citalopram, and escitalopram. The um, fluvoxamine is on here for completeness sake, but it is not used for depression ever. It is only FDA approved for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so that's really only its 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 really its only use. SNRIs are um, drugs that block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine to increase the levels of both in the brain. You have your examples of duloxetine or Cymbalta. Venlafaxin or Fexor, and Desvenlafaxin or Pristique. There are a few others on the market, but they are not approved for depression. They are used for fibromyalgia or other issues, so I didn't include them on this slide because you would still not use them off-label for, for depression or anxiety. A um, couple things to note. Just because they block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, they are not more effective than SSRIs. Um, also, because our SSRIs block serotonin also, they have the same adverse effects, plus they're going to have the adverse effects of increasing that norepinephrine, which, depending on which drug you pick, will tell you how much of a dose-related blood pressure increase you get, you can have a decreased appetite and insomnia. Okay? And overdose is not quite as safe. Still very safe if you have a patient who's um, suicidal. I'd rather put them on an SSRI, but if they need an SNRI, um, overdose may cause hypertension and cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so I would not give this to a person who, who has the potential to overdose and has AFib. You know, but if it was just, you know, but it's fairly safe in a one month supply in a patient who just may have suicidal tendencies. Wellbutrin or bupropion is a, an antidepressant. You'll, you'll see it that people say it has an atypical mechanism of action. It blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. So you see that's unique. We don't touch serotonin at all with this medication. So what are its benefits? It increases the patient's energy level which might be great if we have a patient who has a depressed, uh, who's depressed, who's um, you know fatigued. They're uh, they don't have any motivation. They're just you know they just want to sit on the couch and kind of eat all day and you know that kind of you know they need some motivation. They need they need to get up and go from their their antidepressant. Um, so it's going to increase your patient's energy level. It's going to uh, have a very low incidence of sexual dysfunction because we don't affect serotonin. This is a good one we can switch somebody to if they have the side effect from the SSRIs. You can also use it for tobacco dependence. This is it's it's, it's under the name brand of Zyban, um, but it's the same drug, same exact drug, different label on the bottle. Everything else is the same. Um, but if you've got a patient who also wants to quit smoking and needs an antidepressant, well, why not use one drug? You know, tackle both problems, and it can cause weight loss because it's going to have an appetite um, decrease, 
and um, and boost their energy level. So you know this is this is great for that patient who who's you know used to work out and used to do a lot of things and and now has gained you know tens of pounds you know 30 20 30 40 pounds and you know is is depressed you, you, this is a great option for them um, but because it has that those side effects on on weight and and diet we definitely want to avoid this in people who have eating disorders and we also want to remember that it has a Let's jump to the next slide. That it has a, it does decrease our seizure threshold, which is dose related. So we, we don't want to give this to patients who ha already have a seizure disorder. So adverse effects: nausea, vomiting, which is pretty much a, a side effect of every drug that's ever been made. Um, tremor, insomnia, dry mouth, and skin reactions. Really, the one that I see the most is the insomnia. And so what we can do is we can switch them to maybe an extended release tablet given early in the morning. That way it's kind of fading, you know, before, um, before they go to bed. Our other atypical antidepressant is Remeron or Mirtazapine. So what it does is it enhances serotonin 5 at the 5-H2 and 5-HT3 receptor and norepinephrine. The great thing about this is it has it's, it's it'll lower anxiety has lower anxiety side effects and lower GI side effects. It also has a low incidence of sexual dysfunction, and its adverse effects are sedation, weight gain, dry mouth, and constipation. So if you remember Wellbutrin, it caused an increase of energy and weight loss. Remeron or Mirtazapine is causing sedation and weight gain. So this might be a good option for a patient who is has been depressed and you know are so anxious that they they haven't been eating you know that they're they 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 they're up worrying all night um, they don't have an appetite you know they just they they they're they're kind of having those side effects so this would be a good one to give for that patient um, to help treat that and the, uh, the great thing is is that we don't see a dose dependent weight gain you actually have less weight gain at higher doses so we can we can increase a pay you know let's say they've gained five pounds and they're on you know rimmer on 15 milligrams and they're they're like oh I've gained five pounds which is good but I don't I don't want to gain too much but we don't have to worry about bumping them up to 30 or 45 milligrams because we're not going to have a continued weight gain with the larger doses. So it's a, this is a really good one also depending on how your patient presents. Now, we're gonna get into some other ones, some other medications that are not gonna be used nearly as often. The ones I've mentioned before are our, kind of our, 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 our definitely our first line antidepressant anti-anxiety medications, anti-anxiety maintenance medications. Um, we would still possibly need something PRN, you know, a, a benz, short-acting benzo, clonopin, Ativan, preferably not Xanax because Xanax is habit-forming and, and just you know, works too quickly, I think. Um, you know, and then something long, longer term like Valium is probably a, a longer acting is, is, is too long acting. We want something that's, that's quick. You know, like a, like one of those benzos I mentioned, or Vistaril or Atarax, which will help. So our other ones, Trazodone and Nefazodone. You don't see these used as often anymore, um, except for you'll see Trazodone used for sleep. Now the the sleep dose of Trazodone, we're at 50 milligrams, is a drop in the bucket compared to the antidepressant dosing. The antidepressant dosing of Trazodone is, you know, six to eight hundred milligrams. So where you're really going to see the most effect. So most patients have a hard time tolerating up to that dose before they get before they have side effects because it causes orthostatic hypotension, sedation, cognitive slowing and dizziness. And then each one has its own precaution where trazodone can cause a priapism and nefazodone can cause liver toxicity. So if you notice here we're starting to get into some more uh, more severe side effects. Um, with again, all antidepressants are equally effective, so we're not getting any extra benefit, but we are getting more more side effects. Um, so, you know, we have to we have to watch out watch out for that. We have our tricyclic antidepressants, which uh, I'll, I see a little bit. I'd say 
you know, if SSRIs, SNRIs, Wellbutrin, and Mirtazapine are 92, 93% of antidepressants used, TCAs kind of fall into that other 5 to 10%, whatever that would be. Um, they're, they're, but they're not using, and it's usually amitriptyline. Um, so, and we're, we may be get, using it for something else, also maybe for some fibromyalgia or something like that. Um, kind of, kind of de trying to decrease the pill burden, but still, again, not commonly used. They, th these two um, block norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibition. So, we're going to get side effects similar to our. Um, SSRIs, SNRIs, dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, um, urinary retention, tachycardia, memory impairment, weight gain, sexual dysfunction, again, because we're inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, and delirium. Um, we also have precautions. Uh, they can cause orthostatic hypotension, and they can cause heart blocks and, and arrhythmias. So just like our previous slide, we're getting... Um, we're getting more and more side effects, more and more precautions, and that without without a benefit, um, you know, so that that risk benefit comparison is is definitely leaning towards risk right now, as opposed to you know what benefit do you gain from it? Um, plus, these have to be titrated or tapered over seven over several days because we don't want patients to have too many side effects when they start, and we also don't want to have you know rebound side effects when we um, we take them off. MAOIs, um, not commonly used anymore. Um, they they because of a lot of what we'll talk about in a minute. So they increase norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, but they have strict dietary restrictions. Um, so that you have they have restrictions on foods that, that contain tyramine. So it's um, you know processed cheese and cheeses and meats and um, beer and wine and what else. Um, it's really just easier to, to look up a list of medications. But those are the main ones people, most people eat. Um, you have lots of side effects, postural hypertension, sedation, um, you know, deep fever, deep tendon reflexes, hypertensive events, especially if, they're, if they don't follow the dietary restrictions, met restrictions for medications. I don't see these commonly used. Now, where I do see a medication that acts as an MAOI used is the antibiotic linazolid. Linazolid does act as an MAOI, so you have to be very careful when you're giving it to a patient who has psychiatric, a psychiatric disorder because you don't want to get serotonin syndrome, which we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, you know, so you, you, you have to be careful. Um, linazolid's great because it's, uh, it's, it, it covers a lot of it's oral and it has a lot of bacteria that it covers that other medications that are only I that, that are oral don't but we do need to keep that drug interaction in mind that you you cannot give them together I mentioned st. John's wort here I, I don't recommend st. John's wort um, for, for depression uh, it's not regulated the efficacy is mixed at best the doses are not equivalent from manufacturer to manufacturer and don't have to be equivalent from bottle to bottle. And it has significant drug interactions. Um, you know, potentially it has had effects in the past, but I always like to remind people that, especially your herbal components, your vitamins and all that kind of stuff on that aisle, they get to go on the market until the, until the FDA sees that they're unsafe. They do not have to prove any type of efficacy and safety before they get put on the shelf. I think there's too many risks with St. John's wort, not enough benefit to recommend it for a treatment of anxiety or depression. So how do you choose the right medication? We talked about this earlier. These are kind of the, the, the steps to go through to, to pick which medication you're gonna recommend for a patient. If you want an initial antidepressant choice, here's a good chart to kind of target, if you target with certain, um, um, if you're going trying to avoid certain side effects or like fluoxetine for compliance issues because it has a long half-life, it's great. You can you don't have to take it every day to keep your ser your keep your you know level up. So um, here's a chart for those on which ones to to target. Here's the 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 reverse of that. So which ones do you want to avoid? Maybe want to avoid for certain patients. Um, so 
this will be just something to help uh, keep with you. So, serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is a potentially life-threatening condition associated with increased serotonergic activity. It causes mental status changes that include ag anxiety, agitated delirium, restlessness, and disorientation. It also has autonomic manifestations like diaphoresis, tachycardia, hyperthermia, hypertension, vomiting, and diarrhea, and it can manifest as a tremor, muscle rigidity, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, and bilateral Babinski sign. Now, most times... I've heard people when I hear people talk about serotonin, it is a it's a it's a thing that's on a label that can't happen. Um, it's just on there to cover, you know. We're just we're just it's just for CYA, you know. We're just covering our tails to put it on there. I actually know someone who was diagnosed with serotonin syndrome. She went to the emergency room. She thought she was having a heart attack. The doctors thought she was having a heart attack. Everybody in the hospital thought she was having a heart attack. But it was very weird that. All the tests came back negative. There was no heart muscle damage. There was no um, tissue damage. There was no, nothing, and, and nothing, nothing that would have showed up for a heart attack was showing up. And her symptoms were not resolving. You would think at a certain point, you know, you're either gonna, your symptoms are gonna start to subside, or you know, you're you're gonna die. Um, but it just kept going. It wasn't until they did her medication reconciliation that they realized that they that she was having serotonin syndrome. Now, why did she have it? It wasn't because she was on one antidepressant. She was on dr many drugs that affect serotonin. She was on two antidepressants. She was on tramadol for pain, which ha has serotonergic activity. She was on um, serotonergic medication for migraines. And she had, I think, been taking them a little more frequently than she was supposed to, and so, and then I, she was added when she was added a fifth drug that had serotonergic activity. That's when she developed serotonin syndrome. It's not one single drug. It's not even kind of a high dose of one drug. It's usually that combination of several that have that effect. It's like a lot of drugs when we look at medications that say they can prolong your QT interval. For most of us who don't already have a cardiac issue, it's not a big deal. But it is if you add four or five medications that, that prolong your Q, QT interval. So that's where I worry about serotonin syndrome is when we start adding on multiple medications that, that build up on that serotonergic activity. Um, so you, you want to be cognizant of that, of that patient. And what, we did for, what they did for her is... How they treated her? Well, they discontinued some of her serotonergic medications. They switched her tramadol to something. Switch the easy stuff first. They switched her tramadol to something else. We can give other stuff for pain. They switched her Imitrex or her, her triptan for migraines to something else, at least for now. And then they tweaked one of her antidepressants and I believe put her on Wellbutrin as one of them. So we got rid of that serotonergic activity. Her symptoms resolved and she's been fine ever since. Um, you know, do supportive care for any, uh, any, si any symptoms she's having. Um, you can do cy ciproheptadine, which basically counteracts the serotonergic activity if, support if supportive care is not, not helping, and symptoms usually resolve within 24 hours of treatment. Then you obviously want to chart that the patient had serotonin syndrome because you don't, you, you don't know who's going to be adding these types of medication because... You know, what if she is, what if somebody didn't know she had serotonin syndrome and then started linazolid for a, um, an MRSA infection she had? You know, we know linazolid works for it. I'll just give them that. And then she develops serotonin syndrome again. So, um, you want to watch out for, for that. Make sure you chart in there that it was, um, that the patient had the serotonin syndrome due to multiple serotonergic medications. So you start a medication. You, you know they don't have serotonin syndrome. How do you know if it's working? Um, you're going to see some symptom improvement within the first two weeks of treatment. That is usually, um, what starts to come back is usually um, appetite, agitation, and anxiety usually, um, usually kind of start, start coming back to normal. Then you're going to start seeing the real depressive symptoms um, you know, kind of resolving after, or, or moving in the right direction by weeks, you know, four to six, possibly week eight. So if you 
full remission may not see, be seen until weeks eight or 12, but you at least want to give four to six weeks before you decide to add another therapy or to move on to a different therapy. Because it is a gradual, um, a gradual resolution of symptoms. A lot of people think, I'm going to take this medication three days later, boom, it's like a light switch. And it's, it's definitely not that. It's gradual. A lot of patients will not have remission on one medication. There's quite about a third of patients are not going to have a response to antidepressants. They're going to need counseling also. Um, so, uh, so make sure you give the medication enough time to work. Well, we've talked about we talked about duration earlier. So we're going to jump over these slides. Very similar slides. Um, very similar slides for the antidepressants. Benzos. Like we said earlier, they enhance GABA neurotransmission, which slows down responses to successive impulses. They're not considered first line because of abuse potential. You want to make you want to try to use them just as PRN medications. Um, you want to use a, a shorter or intermediate acting um, benzo, clonopin, and, and Ativan are, are going to be your your most common ones. You also have a GABA agonist called Buspar. That, that is approved for general anxiety disorder. Um, just real quickly on Buspar, because I don't think it's mentioned very, no, it's not mentioned very much. Um, Buspar works, it's very, very tolerable. It's given three times a day, so those pa the patients feel good about being able to put, um, there's something cathartic about taking a tablet three times a day when you have anxiety. Um, you know, it, it is effective. But it is less effective once it's been given after a course of, of benzos. Whether that's patient per perceived efficacy or there's, there's something about the way the, the benzo actually affects the GABA receptor, um, it's not known. But it's, it's, uh, rele it's relief of symptoms is less after you know, a prolonged trial of benzos, especially if it's been a maintenance dose. You know, they've just been getting Ativan one, twice a day for several weeks. Um, but it, it's still, it is very effective. Um, it's a good, it's very, very tolerable, very tolerable. So, um, and, you, and it's got a lot of different dosages, so you can really tweak it to a patient. So um, it's definitely got its benefits. So you can see here they talk about abuse again because um, uh, abuse of benzos is, is, is prevalent. And once patients are on them, they, they are not going to be happy when you recommend coming off of it. I, I can tell you right now, um, they, they want their clonopin and their Ativan. It's hard to get them off of it. They've been on it for months. You're, if they've been on it for several months, you're talking weeks and weeks of tapering them off of it to do it properly without them having rebound symptoms. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun if they get on it long term. Obviously, non-drug non approaches, always very important. Push those, push those, push those, because they are very, very effective. Um, yeah, recommend that your patients get um, some kind of therapy. Monitoring. None of these medications have any type of drug level blood testing that you actually have to do. Um, you want to assess the patient frequently for response, possible side effects, safety, increased suicidal ideation because our SSRIs are linked to, um, in adolescents, an increased, increased suicidal ideation. Now, it scares a lot of people where the studies that this was done on, there was not an increase of suicidal suicide attempts or even a higher percentage of successful suicide. But there is there is a link to increased suicidal ideation of the thought of it and that kind of thing. So um, you definitely want to, you know, if you have a patient who's starting one of these, let them know that there's there's support, that they can they need to call if they have any, any abnormal thoughts or, or worsening thoughts. Discontinuing, slow taper, taper off. Um, you know, 
and what we can we'll talk about that more in the psychopharmacology class in the summer. So quickly, antipsychotics. A few, just a few slides, because unless you're doing, unless your 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 discipline is psychiatry, you're not gonna you're not gonna be prescribing antipsychotics. Um, we're gonna talk about the two, you know, the typicals and your atypicals, or first generations and second generations, and then leave it at that. The summer class, we'll talk about what makes each antipsychotic different, because they they are they are very they are different when you would use them and side effects and drug interactions, things like that. So, antipsychotics were discovered in the 1950s. Chlorpromazine was actually used during surgery, but it was observed to be having antipsychotic effects for patients who had psychotic symptoms. Now, you, we have our typical antipsychotics, which came from chlor chlorpromazine, um, that all work on positive symptoms. So, positive symptoms of schizophrenia, in a nutshell, are like delusions, hallucinations, things that the, the symptom gives you. Um, but they work by blocking dopamine. They block dopamine so that the dopamine can't hit the, re the receptors in the brain. But blocking dopamine can also cause secondary negative symptoms. Negative symptoms are what the disease takes away. So, you know, it causes a you know, lack of motivation and um, kind of dulls your fight or flight response. So it's you're not looking out for yourself. There's Lack of pleasure seeking, lack you don't do the hobbies that you used to do, um, you know things like that. So, uh, so that's so. Then we have so your your typicals or your first generations can can worsen negative symptoms, but the thought is with your atypicals that do more than just blocking dopamine that those don't worsen negative symptoms. Um, that I don't know that they make negative symptoms better. But they, they, um, that's up for debate, um, and just it's kind of a cir circular debate between most people. But your typicals can have, can make second, can make negative symptoms worse. So your typical antipsychotics block dopamine, alpha one histaminic, histaminic and muscarinic receptors. Your dopamine causes relief of positive symptoms. Your other ones can cause side effects, along with. The dopamine blockade. Your atypical antipsychotics have an effect on serotonin along with the receptors mentioned above. Now all of your antipsychotics have varying degrees of when they hit dopamine, serotonin, alpha-1, histamine receptors, muscarinic receptors, all those kind of things. We'll get into specifics in the, in the summer course. But in a nutshell, your first generation antipsychotics, if they're high potency ones like Haldol and Prolixin, most people have heard of those. They block dopamine receptors, the D2 receptor, and they have very little binding with the other receptors. Their side effects are mainly extrapyramidal side effects, so the movement disorders that come with antipsychotics. And they have very they have much less sedation and orthostatic hypotension. Your low potencies block dopamine receptors and have anticholinergic and antihistaminic effects. So they have less EPS, but they do cause more sedation or and sedation and orthostatic hypotension. Most of them are metabolized through cytochrome P450 2D6. It's the only enzyme you have to remember for most of these. And there's no well-established therapeutic levels with, with these. You can get a drug level for most of these, and all it's going to tell you is, is the patient taking it? Doesn't even tell. I mean, you, you don't you don't know what it doesn't correlate to anything. So I don't recommend doing it. Here's again the side effects: extrapyramidal side effects, cognitive side effects, hyperprolactinemia. You will see that in in some patients. Um, obviously, there are different reasons that's bad for males and females. Um, you have you can have QT prolongation. That is. Uh, yeah, jump on my soapbox real quick about QT prolongation. That is a a that is a valid worry that I think most people worry about too much. QT prolongation with most antipsychotics that we still use today is is about 10 to 20 milliseconds of the QT interval. Now, for most people, that doesn't matter one bit. You know, Haldol is about 10, maybe 15. The only one above it is Geodon, which is an atypical. But where you're going to see that the most is if, if a patient's getting repeated repeated IM or IV 
doses of Haldol. They, you don't see a whole lot of it with the, the PO doses. I think people, I think it scares people a lot when they see that QT prolongation. I've had, I've had people call me from other hospitals asking about it, and there are patients on like Haldol one milligram three times a day. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not worried about your QT prolongation. Bump them up to five three times a day. You know, a maximum dose that we want to give is 45 milligrams a day. So they're really giving them nothing. So um, it's a valid concern, something to remember, especially if they have an arrhythmia. But in and of itself, in an oral form, is not going to do a whole lot. So second generation antipsychotics, they are known as atypicals. They are atypical because they also work on serotonin. It's just a term they got when uh, clozaril came out was the when it was when it came out initially. They have less extrapyramidal side effects. Notice I didn't say none. They have less, and they have less worsening of negative symptoms. They do have more metabolic side effects, um, and so and and so they are atypical because of that 5-HT 2A or the serotonin 2A antagonism. So the metabolic, uh, sorry. So they're used in many psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, and you've seen a lot of these. Um, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Clozaril, um, Abilify, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot, in Vega, there's a lot of them out there. Um, so they're, they're very tolerable. Um, you know, they, they do have metabolic side effects. They're, they have other side effects, but they're, they seem to be very, very tolerable for patients. But you have to, you have to monitor um, metabolic parameters because it'll cause weight gain, uh, blood sugar changes, dyslipidemia, things like that. So you want to monitor on a set schedule for anybody who's on a second generation antipsychotic. I've seen patients gain over 100 pounds on Zyprexa. It happens, you know, and they'll stop taking it when they realize they've gained that much. You know, most people don't, don't recognize five pounds, but when they've gained 30, 40, 100, they're going to recognize and, and discontinue. So you want to watch a patient. doesn't mean they're going to they're gonna always gain weight on it, but, it, but your second generations are going to have more metabolic side effects than your first generations. Here's a chart that talks about the, the risk of side effects based on each second generation. So you can see there's a low, medium, and, and high risk, on some, low, moderate, and high on some of these, um, even a very low here. Um, doesn't say none, obviously. Remember, they, it's still possible, but that's, that way you can kind of compare them all uh, you know, using this chart. So real quickly, mood stabilizers and ADHD. Mood stabilizers that we use um, for bipolar disorder. Lithium, Depakote, and then secondary, Tegretol, Trileptal, and then a few other anticonvulsants. Lithium is very, very effective. Um, mechanism of action is still somewhat unknown. Um, it has a long half-life. It is a narrotherapeutic drug. So we're going to draw levels for of its trough to be between 0.6 and 1.5. Um, you want to monitor that. You know, we monitor it five days after any dose change because it gives it time to get to steady state. And then um, we'll go out monthly and then every three months after that. You Adverse drug reactions. It's a neurotherapeutic index, so you can get toxicity. And that toxicity can lead to EKG changes um, and actually coma and, and, and death if it, if it does go high enough. Um, so you're going to want to monitor this, and you want to maintain adequate salt intake. So dehydration or um, changes in sodium can change lithium. Whatever the the easy way easy way to remember it, the body sees lithium as the same thing as sodium. So whatever happens to sodium happens to lithium. And if you're dehydrated, the body holds on to sodium to retain water to, to hold water. So it's going to hold on to lithium. If you get on a drug that causes sodium, um, you know, uh, sodium depletion, you're going to decrease the lithium also. Easy way to remember it. Depakote is, is, works by blocking GABA and other neurotransmitters. It is metabolized by all of these enzymes. Um, what's great about these is, is not, a whole lot of, not, not a whole lot affects Depakote's level, even though we do we, we draw serum level, we worry about drug interactions, we're really worried about what Depakote does to other drugs. 
not so much worried about what Depakote does, what happens to Depakote. The the balance the, the the caveat to that is Lamictal. Depakote and Lamictal are metabolized very similarly, and if we give Depakote and Lamictal together without adjusting a dose, we have a very high risk of Stevens Johnson syndrome because of the, of the Lamictal. You're gonna want, once a patient's therapeutic, monitor the plasma levels every three months. And patient education, there are a lot of side effects that go with, with Depakote, just like Lamictal, just like our mood stabilizers. They're not clean drugs. Um, but bruising and delayed clotting, because we're going to get a dose-dependent platelet reduction, patients who are on Depakote. Um, so you just it's, it's expected. It's not a reason to stop a patient's medication unless they do develop thrombocytopenia. Again, here's more on lithium. I'm, I'm not going to read through these. Um, they're, they're a good list to keep, you know, what side effects to expect, which ones are dose-dependent short-term, which ones are long-term, um, what the symptoms are, different levels of lithium toxicity. I could read through them, but, you know, it's it, everybody can read, you know, y'all and then y'all keep those for, for late use later. Um other ones that have some evidence of mood stabilizations, Lamictal, Gabapentin, and Topamax, um, with, with their side effects being the same side effects we see if they're used for, for epilepsy. ADHD, this is a quick one. Because for ADHD, we have... Let's skip all this. We have two, two types of medication, really three types of medication. Well, stimulants and non-stimulants. In that stimulants, you have methylphenidate, and amphetamine. Everything that is written as a C2 for, a, a, for ADHD is a derivative of methylphenidate or amphetamine. The only medication that's commonly used um, for ADHD that's not one of those is atomoxetine or stratera, and it is actually its mechanism of action is closest to an antidepressant, um, dealing with serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. But all of what you see mostly, Vyvanse, um, Concerta, Adderall, Ritalin, all the ones that I, I don't even remember their name brands anymore. There's so many of them these days. But they're all derivatives of methylphenidate and amphetamine. So the difference being how many times a day you have to take it, how long acting is it, and then is it which isomer is it. You know, you're kind of... You find one that works, then you kind of tweak down to which the exact one you need. If you know once a day, or if you need a, a once a day, and then one that it's also twice a day. You'll also see um, extended release clonidine or extended release guanfacine used. This is secondary if if they are if the patient is treatment resistant because they're not as as um, tolerable. So stimulants. Uh, Drug uh, adverse drug reactions, appetite suppression. So you want to, if if you can, um, give them around meals. So what's a good thing to do is, especially a lot of people want to take a once a day uh, ADHD medication. I would too. So like Vyvanse or Concerta, they're given they're given once a day. Well, you may want to give it after the person eats a large breakfast because if I'm gonna have, if you're gonna suppress my appetite for lunch and possibly dinner. Well, then breakfast is really my only option. So if I can eat, eat, you know, breakfast is my largest meal and then take my medicine, it's affected by the time I get to work or school. So that helps get around the appetite suppression. It can, in overdoses or for patients who shouldn't be on a stimulant, cause tachycardia, dizziness, headache, insomnia, and growth suppression. Um, small amount of growth, growth suppression, but probably not. Probably not enough height to not be treated if a patient ad actually has ADHD. Um, your non-stimulant, atomoxetine, you can have increased blood pressure, tachycardia, headache, um, very similar to stimulants and a pro pro prolonged QT interval. And then your alpha agonist, you're going to have the same side effects as if they were taking it, taking these for hyper hypertension. So bradycardia, hypertension, syncope, AV block, dizziness, and drowsiness. So rational drug selection. If you have a preschooler, you want first-line behavioral therapy. Um, next, dextroamphetamine. Um, and, and methylphenidate is safe and effective. So, you know, you probably don't want an, an all-day extended-release stimulant for, for a preschooler. 
Um, probably something that gets them till till lunchtime is is probably probably plenty. You know that way they still have an ap- appetite for the rest of the day. They still have lots of growing to do. Um, you know, you know, let you know. In the afternoons, they're probably playing and not really focused on school anyway. So let them kind of have off periods of of the medication so that they're not just on it at all times. School age children stimulants are first line. Choice is based on the formulation, so dextroamphetamine or methylphenidate. Do I want to? Do I need a liquid, a capsule, extended release? Um, each one is, is kind of different um, in the dosage form. The duration of action. So do I want to take it twice a day? So I get some at breakfast and some at lunch, and it kind of helps me through my classes. Take one a day, and then it's kind of going to wear off toward in the evening. Um, how does that work? And then what pay, what the parent preference is? They may not be able to take a twice a day medication because they can't. They're not there at school to give it to them. Um, and if one class doesn't work, just change to the other. So if you try amphetamine and and the the patient gets nothing, no benefit, then go to methylphenidate and its derivatives. Um, they're not the the just because one stimulant doesn't work doesn't mean the other one won't. Adolescents and adults similar. Um, Similar options, uh, point out adolescents, potential for abuse and diversion. That's not just adolescents, that's adults also, let's be honest. Um, you know, so, you know, if you want to have the debate on are they over-prescribed or, or under-prescribed, you know, join the, the long lines of people who, who are, are saying it, but I do think there's a, you know, I think there's, I think there's valid points on both sides. You know, now that we know to look for it, we're probably finding more cases. Um, And then there's probably some people, you know, some people who don't need it, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't withhold treatment, you know, or anything because some people, some people can really really benefit, benefit from them. Uh, Monitoring, very straightforward, patient education, um, you know, I would also on the monitoring weight and growth velocity are important. Weight being most important. Um, that way, you can you can kind of tweak the times of day the patient's getting the medication. Um, you know, and the stimulants are a C, a, a class two controlled substance, so you can only write a one month prescription at a time. Um, and then if you write for three per, separate prescriptions, you have to date you know date them. Do not fill before. And write on the prescription, so there's there's a lot of um, regulations that go into prescribing those. Um, that's about it. That is psych in a nutshell, a very brief nutshell. Um, so if you have any questions or anything, uh, shoot me a, an email.